Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories, where we play tales to take you away from today. Well, it's that time again to board the Horror Express with Jason Dowd. Jason and I talk about time travel, and we will answer Jill Frazier's horrific question. Also on the program today are owls. Two stories in point of fact, and I think you're going to like them. Add in a brand new... Johnny, is this true? Where the dark side of the moon is all the rage. Now, I'll bet you're wondering how we're going to kick this off. Yeah, not so much. Yep, with this... Five Minute Mystery. Another Five Minute Mystery. This Five Minute Mystery is being brought to you by Good Story, Bad Ending. Have you ever watched a movie that you were enjoying only to have it end badly? Then you too have experienced good story, bad ending. It's a good thing that that never happens with the five minute mystery. Right? Egypt. Night. Silhouetted against the amber sky stands the cold and foreboding tomb of Prince Fede Kiam. At the entrance of the tomb stand the figures that compose the Campbell expedition. Good. Sir, well, gentlemen, are you all ready? Indeed, Indeed we, are, we are, yes. Good. Uh, Dr. Martin, you go first. As you wish. I'm right, Penier. Right. Uh, Bill Crane. Yes, sir. And I'll take up the rear. Boy, is it dark in here. What would you expect in a tomb, sunlight? I wonder what would happen if we got lost in here. You know, Penier, you always manage to come up with the nicest thoughts. Why are we stopping? There are four passages branching out here. Oh, that's just fine. I suppose the only thing that we can do is to each take a passage and see where it leads to. How does that sound? Well, well, sensible to me. Right. All, right. To do all right, Ben. And if you find anything, just shout and we'll all come running. Boy, it really is dark in here. You know where all these passages lead to? Oh, well. Good Lord. What was that? What happened? Hey, what, what was that shot? What's happened? Uh, what uh, was Dr. that Martin, shot? What's happened to Campbell? Uh, well, he's been shot, I guess. I was exploring that other tunnel when I heard a shot. I, I came running and found Campbell like this. But who shot him? He must have shot himself. But his gun is still in his holster. Yes, he, he must have tripped on this loose gravel and the gun went off when he fell. Well, come on, we can't let him lie here. Help me carry him out. <laughs> Well, gentlemen, I've examined him. And? I was right. The bullet I took out of his body was fired from Campbell's own gun. I'm sorry to hear you say that. Why? What do you mean? Just that I'm holding you, Dr. Martin, for Campbell's murder. What single clue led Crane to believe that Dr. Martin killed Campbell? In just a moment, we'll give you the solution. But first... <laughs> Well, we have an excellent story that takes place in a lost tomb. One of the best I've heard on these FMSs. However, no motive again plagues us, and I have to ask the question, how did he shoot himself with his gun in his holster? Let's go find out. And now, back to our story. But Campbell wasn't murdered. He shot himself. That's what you try to make us believe. What do you mean? Just this. You said Campbell shot himself when he fell. But his gun was in his holster. Well, Well, anyone knows you can't fire a gun until you've drawn back the firing pin. But what you forgot is that no one has the firing pin released when they're carrying a gun in a holster. But that just proves that Campbell was murdered. It doesn't prove that I killed him. Oh, yes, it does, Mr. Martin. You just told us that the bullet you removed from Campbell's body was fired from his gun. But that's impossible. Therefore, you switched bullets. An innocent man wouldn't have done that. No, Dr. Martin. That one clue proves that you and you alone murdered Campbell. Well, that was... 
was a really bad ending to a rather good story. Isn't it amazing that here on Ron's Amazing Stories that we have things like this happen? Is it a coincidence? <laughs> nah, a good story is a good story, even if it ends badly. So, write that down, and remember, this five-minute mystery was brought to you by Good Story, Bad Ending. Get yours today. On the podcast last week, we had a story called Mr. Mumbles. It was sent in to the podcast anonymously, or at least I thought it was. At the end of the story, I asked the person who wrote it to let me know who they were so that I could give them proper credit. Well, three people wrote in and said that they were the storyteller. I've never had that happen in the eight years of podcasting. What do I do? Well, I sent all three a questionnaire about the original story. You see, I do edit these before reading them. Mostly, the edits consist of sentence fixing and some word changes to make the stories more family-friendly. Normally, I send the edited story back to the author to get their approval. However, in this case, I had to just go with it because I had no one to contact. It was these edits that allowed me to identify the true owner, Shirley Saldana, from Tobomori, Ontario. Now, Shirley never intended to not give her name and location, and she simply mistyped her email. For the record, she was very happy with the edits I did and apologized for using the phrase, Black Eyes, to which I changed to Jet Black Eyes. To the other would-be authors, I say, Crime never pays. Thank you for your story, Shirley. It was much appreciated. I want to remind you that we are quickly approaching the ninth annual month of Spooky. This year is shaping up to be pretty special. It will begin with our 400th episode. This will be a celebration and will feature four UFO stories sent in by you guys. I need lots of scary stories for the month, so if you have something paranormal or a whatever nature, please send it to me. I really need them. So far, I have received three new stories from Michael, Pam, and Jeanette. Thank you, guys. And now, this word from Audible. Today's podcast is being brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle. Whatever you have, you can listen to Audible on it. So what am I listening to right now? 22 short sci-fi stories, a flash fiction collection, narrated by James K. White. This is a collection of 22 science fiction stories that range from tales of time travel, dystopian futures, the apocalypse, aliens, genetic engineering, and so much more. They are very short and so very well written and narrated. Truly a welcome addition to my collection. And if I'm being honest, they had me at short stories, my bread and butter. The novel was written by Angela Cavanaugh, who is a Amazon bestseller. She began writing in high school between and during classes. Eventually, she realized that writing could be more than a hobby. She fell in love with flash fiction and began posting the short stories to her blog. 22 short stories, a flash fiction collection, reached number six on the Amazon bestseller list and is a popular selection on Audible. What makes these short stories exceptional is the way you immediately understand the bigger picture of the world and its dynamics. In just a few sentences. It is very well written. Now, you can own these 22 stories today. 
Here's what Audible has set up for us. Audible is offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you can get 22 stories free today. Thank you, Audible. And now it's time for your stories. Owls have long been the subject of myth and superstition. Are these mysterious, large-eyed, nocturnal creatures fearsome, wise, ghostly? I think probably all of the above. Owls are enigmatic. They are beautiful, mysterious, intriguing, fierce, spooky, and thanks to Harry Potter, owls are more enchanting than ever before. I've been saving this short tale from Nia Mayer for quite some time. She writes us this story from Prescott, Arizona. I've always been fascinated with owls. They seem so wise and scary at the same time. I once had one save my life. I can't explain it. I was driving home from a gig on a dark autumn night. We had just played a local bar, and I was excited. I wasn't watching the road and had an accident. When I woke up, my car was wrapped around a tree, and I was pinned down. Scared, I looked for my cell phone, but it was nowhere to be found. I looked out the smashed window, and there was an owl. He looked right at me, or rather, through me. I can't explain it. I just felt like everything was going to be okay. I passed out. I woke up next in the hospital. I had some broken bones and a concussion, but would fully recover. I know this isn't much of a story, and I don't know why, but I thank that owl for being there. Nia Mayer Prescott, Arizona. Well, Nia, I thank the owl as well. Owls truly are something odd, and there's so much that we can learn from them. Later on in the show today, we will have an amazing story that shows us a different side of the woodland creatures. One that we may not like so much. Thank you for your story, Nia. It was a good one. as we pull into Death Station. that begins and ends in terror. (laughs) I am the conductor, and it's my job to ride this train for all eternity and coordinate the daily activities. Today, we have Ron and Jason aboard, and they're here to talk about time travel and answer a question of religion from Jill Fraser, who lives in Long Beach, California. I may have died there once. Anyway, here is Jason and Ron. Hey, Ron. Say, that was weird. I just saw a hellhound walking backwards. Really? I had a chat with the conductor and he was talking backwards. Didn't make him any less understandable, I might add.
Jason, I think we were just part of a major time slip. I think we were, and they said it wouldn't work. Time travel is possible. And that is what we're here to talk about today, just like we said on the last program we would. So Jason, I'm gonna let you start. How is time travel possible? Well, Ron, I see time travel being possible, not in the physical sense that you would know, where you'd actually go experience a different time physically we can feel it touch it smell it and engulf your life around it for a brief moment in time or however long you're there it's not like the movies but i believe that we can experience time travel by music and by old time radio and by old time television and i'll explain it really quickly by this when you hear an old song or you hear a song in general you hear an old time radio you see an old time television show you can get transported back to either a time where you experienced it and it brings back a memory of maybe you with your family and you know something funny happened or just a good time in your life it can also help you through a rough time by taking you back to a better time and you can actually if you even if you've never been there before like let's just say we're we're listening to an old time radio show you can picture what it was like in the 1930s 20s 40s whatever it may be you can see the families kind of huddled, huddled around these old-fashioned radios you can hear the, the sound of the, of the show as it's being played. And you can actually see what it was like in that time frame if you allow yourself to do it. I'm going to take you one better, Jason. Okay. I am going to play something. I'm going to play you a piece of radio from the early 30s, okay? okay. Take a listen to this. Well, here it comes, ladies and gentlemen. We're out now outside of the hangar. And what a great sight it is. A thrilling one. It's a marvelous sight. It's coming down out of the sky, pointed directly towards us and toward the mooring mass. The mighty diesel motors just roared, their propellers biting into the air and throwing it back into a gale-like whirlpool. No wonder this great floating palace can travel through the air at such a speed with these powerful motors behind it. Now, the sun is striking the windows of the observation deck on the eastward side and sparkling like gl- glittering jewels on a background of black velvet. And every now and then, the propellers are caught in the rays of the sun, and their highly polished surfaces reflect circles of gold. Now, a field that we thought active when we first arrived has turned into a moving mass of cooperative action. The landing crews have rushed to the post, posts and spots, and orders are being passed along, and last-minute preparations are being completed for the moment we have waited for so long. The ship is riding majestically toward us like some great feather riding as though it was mightily, mighty proud of the place it's playing in the world's aviation. The sh- ship is no doubt busting Wake with activity, as we can see. Orders are shouted to the crew. The passengers are probably lining the windows, looking down at the Our field ahead of them, mooring, getting no. their glimpse of the mooring mass. And these giant flagships standing here, the American Airlines flagships, waiting to rise them to all points in the United States when they get the ship moored. There are a number of important persons that's on board, and no doubt the new commander, Captain Max Trish, is thrilled, too, for this is his great moment, the first time he's commanded the Hindenburg. For on previous flights, he acted as the chief officer under Captain Lehman. It's practically standing still now. They've dropped ropes out of the nose of the ship and uh, it's been taken a hold of down on the field by a number of men. It's starting to rain again. It, the rain had uh, slacked up a little bit. The back motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it from... It bursts into flame, bursts into flame, and it's falling, it's crashing. Watch it, watch it, watch it. I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait. Get this started, get this started. It's flying, and it's crashing. It's crashing terrible. Oh, my, get out of the way, please. It's burning and bursting into flames, and, and it's falling on the morning bath, and all the folks between us. This is terrible. This is one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's, 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 it's flashing 20, oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky, and it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now, and the frame is crashing to the ground, not quite to the mooring mast. All the humanity and all the passengers screaming around here. I don't... I can't even talk to people whose friends are out there. It's... it's, it's oh, I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. Honest, it's just like there are massive smoking wreckage. And everybody can hardly breathe and talk and scream, lady. I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Honestly, I, I can hardly breathe. I, I'm going to step inside where I cannot see it. <laughs> Charlie, that's terrible. <laughs> I can't. I, listen, folks, I, I'm going to have to stop for a minute because I've lost the voice. This is the worst thing I've ever witnessed. Wow. See, that's exactly what I'm talking about. 
you, if, you, if you don't know what that is, you know that there's something major going on there. And now we know that it was the Hindenburg ex explosion. You've probably seen some video of it sometime. It, it used to be on commercials. You see it on YouTube, all different places. If you, you can actually go back to that time and picture that. You just close your eyes and picture it. And you have everything that he had. Yeah. He had to take that moment and tell you with his eyes what he was seeing. Right. And then in the background, if you listen really carefully, now I know the recording isn't that great, but it's nearly 100 years old now. But yet, if you listen really carefully, you can hear the people screaming and the fire burning and all of this. And if that isn't time travel, what the heck is? Exactly. I've seen stuff on YouTube and it's about the Titanic sinking. Obviously, there was no audio pieces of that, but just close your eyes for a minute and picture it. You know what the Titanic looks like. You know it was dark. You know it was cold. Just sit there and don't say anything. Just picture the boat sitting there and you can see the panic. You can hear the people screaming. You can see the disarray of everybody not knowing what to do. Everybody wants to try to save themselves and you can hear every creak. You can feel all the cold, crisp air against your skin. That is time travel. I agree 100%. Now, I know a lot of you were probably thinking that we were going to do something different. But the truth is, you too can time travel. And all you got to do is just imagine. That's it. Just open up your open up your eyes, your, your senses, not your physical eyes, but just the inner eye that you have and allow it to happen. The people that can't experience that, close that off. And therefore, they don't use that part of their brain or they refuse to use that part of their brain. But we all have this capability and it's an amazing experience. Can I tell you a quick story? Yeah, yeah, please do. Okay. Growing up, I always heard the song, Sad Song Say So Much by Elton John. We, we, you've all heard the song. Love that song. And I do too. <laughs> and every time I hear the song, I always get brought back to a time where I saw, I was on this old guy's shoulders. We were at a it was like an old building that was being renovated and it looked like a restaurant i wasn't quite sure what kind of restaurant it is but i was riding on his back a, a piggyback ride type thing and my brother was there my dad was there that has been going on since probably 87 so we're looking at maybe probably like 32 years and so finally in 2015 i asked my dad because i came out in the uh, car while i was driving home from work i said you know what dad Every time I hear that song, I always get brought back to this old guy in this warehouse looking thing. And it looked like he was trying to build, like remodel a restaurant. Ryan was there, you were there. What is that? Did that really happen or was that a dream? He goes, no. He goes, that was a real thing. He goes, I was helping a client of mine work on, on financing his restaurant. The guy was Gordy Howe. Oh, wow. And he actually did pick you up on his shoulders. He had, he just loved you guys and he would give you piggyback rides. Now, I didn't know who that was. I was probably six, seven, eight years old at the time. I didn't know I didn't know hockey that much. I didn't know a legend, but it stuck in my head. And every time I hear that song, even to this day, I can go right back to that moment because it was playing. That song was actually playing when he did it. That's why I'm connected to that song. And it sends me back to 1985. Wow, can I say it one more time? Absolutely. If that isn't time travel, what is? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> A song can take us so many different places, and I agree with you. There are so many songs for me like that that take me back to different places in my life. So I couldn't agree with you more. And I'm going to say this is the first time we are in full agreement on anything. Yes, that's true. <laughs> but you know what What I love about this is it's paranormal, it's sci-fi, but yet it's not. It's obtainable. And it's something I think we can all relate to if we just think about it for a moment. Well said, Jason. Well said. Shall we get on to our mail for today? We only have one letter, but it's a doozy. It is a doozy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready for it. It actually came through the comment section of Ron's Amazing Stories. So it's, it's a little bit lengthy, but I'm going to get through it, and I think you guys are going to enjoy this. Hey, Ron, I love the direction you have been taking your podcast. You are the only one out there doing something like this. I love the two new segments with Jason and Sylvia. I have a comment and question for you and Jason. I have come to the conclusion that you are a conservative and Jason's quite a radical. No offense. I was raised a strict Catholic and taught basically not to believe anything that I can't see or touch. I have since married a born-again Pentecostal preacher, and as you might imagine, this has caused issues. Here's my question for you guys. Does religion really matter? After all, we are going to die someday and either become spirits or fertilizer. 
I'm very interested in how you guys answer this. I know it's not horror related, but I think the answer might be. That's from Joe Frazier, Long Beach, California. Well, I got a pretty good answer for this. Jason, I'm all ears. Okay. To what people want to believe, no, I'm not I'm not radical at all. In fact, I grew up in probably one of the strictest denominations of the Lutheran religion that you could possibly imagine. I grew up in the church. My great grandmother and grandfather founded the church. I went to the school attached to the church. I went to church every Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday night. When I moved down to Florida, I went to church three times a week. I got confirmed in the church. When I got older, I started working in the church. So I had been around the church my entire life. It was 1987 when I saw my first ghost. And honestly, I didn't know what to expect. I went to the church for an answer, and they told me exactly what you said. You can't believe anything that you cannot see. Well, I saw it. So how do you explain it? And that's when I I started realizing, because they started threatening to kick me out of school if I continued to talk about it or ask more questions. And I always believe in asking questions. This is how we grow as a human being. And as far as ghosts and demons, people say they don't exist. But if you believe in the Bible, the Catholic religion, the, the Lutheran religion, Baptist, whatever it may be, you will read that God, Jesus, physically pushed demons into a pile of pigs and sent them off a cliff. The Bible has talked about demons, spirits, all throughout. So if it doesn't exist, it wouldn't exist in the Bible. I truly believe with my heart and soul that demons exist because I physically experienced one. That was kind of my eye opener. I too didn't want to believe everything and I started not believing everything because I was told that it was wrong. What that did is that caused me to go into a deep depression because I thought I was nuts. I started disarraying myself from my friends I didn't want people to see what I could see because I could see spirits a lot. And I started questioning my own sanity and I realized that's wrong. Religion is there for a reason. And I truly believe in God. I believe in God with 100% of my heart, body and soul. I don't doubt that he exists at all. And I believe that he's my Lord and Savior. But I do believe that in life, we have to have a balance of good and evil. And sometimes if you don't have that, you either, and everything's too good, You take things for granted. You don't appreciate what you have. And you walk through life feeling a little bit indestructible. On the other hand, when everything's too bad for you, you get depressed. You feel like life's worthless and that you're worthless. So you have to have that balance. And I believe that's where this stuff comes in. Now, the Bible does say that when you die, you you are dead and you do not come back. So how does that explain the people that I've seen? Well, I don't have an answer for that yet. And that's what I'm trying to shoot for. I'm trying to find that answer. My hypothesis is that these are demons that are trying to trick us into disbelieving the Bible. I could be completely wrong, but I could also be completely right. You know, demons do not conform to the things that we're used to in life. Their job is to manipulate. Their job is to trick. Their job is to get you to disbelieve in God in any way, shape, or form. So what's one of the best ways of doing that? Bam, there's your grandma in front of you. She Hmm. died 20 years ago. So you start to disbelieve the Bible. Now, this is only a hypothesis. I can't prove that that's right or wrong. I really hope someday that I will get that answer. And that's why I continue to do this. But what I realized a long time ago is that you cannot stop asking questions. Just because it's taught to you in one way, shape or form does not mean that it's right. You know, there is always a possibility of having an alternative viewpoint, but I do believe that religion does play a part in this, but it shouldn't play the entire part. Remember, there's hundreds of different religions out there. Every religion is a different interpretation of the Bible. The Quran, which is the Muslim Bible, actually uses the exact same Old Testament as the Catholic Bible and as the King James Version of the Bible. So therefore, we believe in the same God. We have a different belief of the, of the prophet. So therefore, what you got to look at is, do you believe in God and Jesus? If you do, that's great. Religions are simply just, all they really are, are just different types of celebrations and different types of beliefs and different types of ceremonies. So religion does matter in a way, but it doesn't matter on things like this either. I have disbelieved in a lot of different religions. I don't necessarily go to church. I don't believe you have to go to church to believe in God and or believe in or not believe in, in ghosts or the supernatural. That's up to you. I know the church wants you to go there. You know, the church makes a lot of money off of us. 
That's why they want you to know. <laughs> and working in a church, I realized that the hard way. It actually opened up my eyes to how evil the church can actually be. I believe that all God says and all the Bible says is that you have to believe in Jesus Christ if you're your Lord and Savior, and you're saved. And if the Bible's right, that's all you need to do. If the Bible's wrong and it was just created by people, like some people say, then nothing happens, right? Nothing, nothing happens at all. But I'd much rather take the shot that the Bible is right. I believe it. The Bible's fascinating, and I really hope that you you read the Bible because it will help answer a lot of questions on how other people see the world. And I, I encourage everybody to read the different types of Bibles that are out there and study some of these religions because it helps you relate to other people and how they see the world. So yes, I do believe in spirits. I have been beaten up by a demon. I have been attacked by spirits. I don't know what they are. I do know what the demon is, but I don't know what the spirits are yet. But that doesn't mean that I that they don't exist. It doesn't mean that I didn't see what I saw and that I'm really crazy. And I believe that, yes, religion does play a part in this as well. So I hope that answers a little bit. I know it's a little bit lengthy, but um, I, I hope it. I hope it's a, an answer that opens up your eyes. Well, Jason, I think that that's some of the best things that you've ever said. I, I am in awe of what you just said. You really, really have given that some thought. I'm going to ask you a question. Shoot. Jason, do you really think I'm all that conservative? Actually, no. Jason, do you remember when you first met me way back when? Yes, I do. Would you say I was conservative then? You were you were more refined on your on your your beliefs. And that's because you haven't experienced them and you probably didn't talk to somebody that had those types of experiences enough to open up your mind enough to them. And that's important. You know, that's why I love talking to people. And you, and as we talk more, yes, some things have changed, some things haven't. And that's great. That's what that's what opinions are all about. That's what communication is all about. Being open-minded is not being conservative, and that's not being liberal either. Do you realize the role that you actually have played in my life? Do you think it's an accident that we're still here, what, seven years, six years later? Yeah, I remember how we first met, too, and it was pretty cool. I had a gut feeling that something special was going to come out of that first interview. I didn't know what it was. But I just knew something was going to be there for a while. And we are placed in around people and in events in our lives that help us grow as, an, as as human beings. I'm very thankful for everybody that I have in my life. And I have had some amazing people open me up to some amazing things. And I love to be able to do that for other people as well. I think the biggest key in life, and, and I, I know it, I know this very well. You know, when we're when we're kids and we're, we, when we listen to church, when we go to churches and stuff like that, we're told that ghosts can't exist. So the more you do that, you put those blinders like on horses. And what you're doing is you're actually hurting the person because you're shutting their mind to things that kind of changing their mind so that they don't see it. And if they do see it, they question themselves and they start getting frustrated. You don't have those. I love that. And yes. You know, I can't change your mind on everything. You won't change my mind on everything. <laughs> but we are able to have a great discussion about it. And if your opinion resonates better with somebody, awesome. If my opinion resonates better with somebody, awesome. But what we're doing is we're, we're giving them two different sides as best to the truth as possible, and it's working. And you've done it to me. I've done it for you. And I think that's what makes relationships in any way, shape, or form so special. Agreed. I personally am not going to answer this question, and it's not because I don't have an answer, is because pretty much what you just said, I agree with. I am hearing bells and whistles and all kinds of flags going up here, and, and I am in as much shock as anyone that we're, that's twice today that we're in total agreement. <laughs> I know, isn't that great? <laughs> we must be in a time warp, right? <laughs> <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Where's the black hole? I can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So having said all that, I hope, Jill, that we answered your question. I, I think we did. And what it all boils down to is if you'd asked the same question six years ago, you would have gotten a different answer out of me. But I think that over time, growth happens. And I am way more open to all kinds of different things that I wouldn't even accept as a possibility. And I have you to thank and others, but certainly you played a huge role in opening that up for me. And I just want to say publicly, 
Thank you, Jason. Well, you're welcome. And I thank you for doing the same for me as well. You know, I mean, I didn't quite believe in Sasquatch or anything like that. I, I, <laughs> I, I wanted to believe it. I did. But I, you know, again, I didn't have enough evidence behind it. And I didn't have anybody that, that believed it as much as you did. And I live in that in a, that situation. And now you've opened me up to that. And that, yes, this could very well happen. You know, I love that. I think we've put together a podcast. What do you think? I think so. We have some business to get done. This is a good spot to stop and talk about something near and dear to your heart. Gladys goodies. I agree, but not here. Follow me for a second. I have a quick surprise for you. Well, Ron, I invited you back here to the Hellhound Camp, or as I like to call it, the car touched by hell, to talk to you about Gladys goodies. Uh, okay, Jason, but are you going to try to tell me that hellhounds like dog treats? Who doesn't like dog treats? Oh, Every come on. animal likes dog treats. Even Jason, this is, now we're disagreeing. I'm glad. I feel back to normal. We've had too much agreement today. This is not happening. Hellhounds do not like doggy treats. They like meat, don't they? I've never understood that. <laughs> well, my stuff is all meat. It's not processed with any crap. It has no chemicals, no fillers, no byproducts. It's just straight up meat. And you know what? They like to eat on us. So why don't we give them something that uh, save our skin and our limbs and everything else for a little while. Would you agree? Well, that I can agree with. I remember Jimmy. Do you remember little Jimmy? He was the conductor's sidekick. Yes. It used to be his job to feed the hellhounds. Little Jimmy isn't around anywhere, and no one knows for sure where he went. I think he became the food. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Jason, show me that these horrific demon spawn like dog treats. All right, I got one of these chicken ones here, so I'm looking at them. Look at them. They're sitting up. Who's your good boy? Who's your good boy? Oh, look at They're sitting up. Look at They're begging. They're panting. They're, look, they're, they're excited. Look at it. Look at it. Who's your good boy? Who's your good boy? Oh, look at him devour that. Oh, my goodness. If I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I wouldn't believe it. But, ladies and gentlemen, I'm standing here right now, and I'm looking out over what Jason is doing. He's out there in the middle of a group of hellhounds giving them dog treats. And if I would not seen it with my own eyes, I wouldn't believe it. And don't forget, if you want to get your own bag of these things and you want a nice discount... 20% off, all you have to do is hit RONS, R-O-N-S, in the promo code, and you'll get that 20% off your, your purchase when you go online. GladysGoodies.com, G-L-A-D-D-Y-S, G-O-O-D-I-E-S.com. Well, great, and thank you, Jason. Can we go back to the relative safety of Car 13? Of course. Let's get out of here. Well, Jason, that truly was an experience. Yes, it was. So what's going on in the world of Jason Dowd right now? Can you tell us anything about what's happening? Well, not really too, too much. I'm just kind of going with the flow. I I added more stuff on Gladys Goodies, uh, more products, I I guess you could say. We're trying out some stuff for cats. We're trying out some stuff for different apparel and swag, if you will. As far as uh, doing some cool new things, I got a new television show I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually reviving our television show on the AME television. It's been gone for about a year, and that's because I really didn't find a good version of a video. Um, I tried a couple of different platforms. It just wasn't working. And now I have got some amazing people coming on in the next couple weeks. I have Sharon and Bram from Sharon, Lois, and Bram. I have uh, Rebecca Metz from Coop and Kemi Ask the World. I have Bob Virgin, the voice of Porky Pig. I have Michael Campion from Fuller House. Jason Stewart, he has been on so many television shows, it's ridiculous. And I even have Judge Janine Pirro coming on. So we're going to have a lot of really cool video coming up for people. And I think you guys are going to have some fun with it. And where do we go to find those? That's the AMEmagazine.com. That will take you to the main page where you can have links to the radio, television, or magazine. And they will be in the television and radio coming up in the next couple weeks. And I will have all that information in the show notes. Well, Jason, I know that we got one more thing to do before we leave, and it's not your favorite part. No, it's not. 
But I, I have an idea this time. First okay. it was sticks, right? Yes, it was. And then it was rocks. Yes. I have thought about what if we dropped you into the Gulf of Mexico? Ooh, we could do that. And maybe a shark will nibble on I don't know. Is he going to tickle? I don't know, but let's let's do that. I will ask the train to just veer a little closer to the to the ocean side of Tampa, and you just run as fast as you can and jump right out. No bag. What do All you right, think? All right, here we go. Okay. I'm running. I'm running. I'm ready. Cannonball! Ah! Oh, dude, there's a big whale over here. Look, he's tickling me with his, with his little... Johnny, is this true? Okay, I like to surf the internet looking for stories and other oddities. I do this in the name of the podcast, but the truth is, it's fun to see what's out there. What you're about to hear is what I call... Johnny, is this true? I will tell you a story and then ask the question, did I make it up or is it true? Let's get started. This time on... Johnny, is this true? One of my very favorite albums is The Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. It is one of the best-selling albums in history and still charts from time to time on Billboard. We're not going to look at the facts of the album, but rather the actual Dark Side of the Moon. Your job is to decide if my fact is real or if I made it up. Let's get started. Story 1 Did you know that the moon always shows Earth its same face? Is that even possible as it rotates around us? Or am I just feeding you fake cheese? Well, if you said I was right, you're right. The moon is in synchronous rotation with the Earth. Its near side is marked by large dark plains and volcanoes that fill the spaces between the bright ancient crustal highlands and the prominent impact craters. The side we never see is, in fact, the dark side of the moon. Story 2 When we look up at the moon, it appears quite bright in our night sky. But did you know it's actually quite dark in nature? How can this be? Surely I made this one up. I didn't. The moon's surface is actually dark, although when compared to the night sky, it appears very bright, with its reflectance just slightly higher than that of worn asphalt. How about that? Now I know that you're never going to think of your driveway the same way again. Story 3 We now know that the moon is not made of cheese. I'm not sure how they proved that, but perhaps Neil Armstrong tasted it while he was there. However, we do know that the moon has water deposits. Yep, there is water on the moon. Or is there? If you said there was, then you're right. It's in the form of ice trapped within dust and minerals, under the surface. It has been detected on areas of the lunar surface that are predominant in shadow, dark side, and therefore very cold, enabling the ice to survive. This water on the moon was likely delivered to the surface by passing comets. How about that? Story 4 Our last fact is hard to believe. Did you know that our sun and the moon are just about the same size? If you look at them side by side, you can clearly see that they are in fact similar in both shape and size. Amazing, isn't it? (laughs) No, it's not. I totally made that up. 
I'm shocked if anyone believed me. From the earth, both the sun and the moon look to be about the same size. This is because the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, but is also 400 times closer to earth. So they look the same. But one of these things is not like the other. There you have our fun moon facts. I hope you enjoyed our trip into outer space. Do you have any strange but true stories you want to share? If you do, send them to ronsamazingstories at gmail.com and I'll use them if I can. As read by Amazing Stories Read by Amazing People This time on As Read By, we have a story called The Smiling Owl. It was recommended to me by Justin Suttles and comes to us from the website creepypasta.com. They collect stories much like we do and are focused on the paranormal. The Smiling Owl With a terrible taste in my mouth, I awoke from a slumber that seemed so deep I would never emerge. Having gone to bed at 1.17 a.m., it was now only 2.47 a.m. My hour and a half of sleep had seemed infinitely longer than that, filled with twists and turns of the subconscious dream state. But now, reality was all too real. When I say this taste in my mouth was terrible, I don't mean that standard gopher crap breath that every middle-aged man wakes up to. This taste was very abrasive and unusual, not bitter, but sickly sweet, making me want to vomit. The closest thing I could compare it to would be the aftertaste of cheap rum mixed with some form of liquefied candy corn. My bare feet touched the cold, hard ground of my new studio apartment, and I walked past my bedroom window into the bathroom. Looking in the mirror, I opened my mouth in hopes of identifying the source of the taste, only to find that my tongue was covered in white gunk, almost like plaque. Confused, I then brushed my tongue and teeth to eliminate the taste to no avail. Beginning to become restless, I then went into the kitchen. Opening the cabinets one by one, I had my mind set on finding something to cut through this terrible flavor. The best thing I found was lemon juice, and I began downing it like water. Frustratingly enough, the liquid glided over the plaque on my tongue just like a protective film, never even touching my taste buds. Throwing the lemon juice to the ground, I went back to the bathroom. Suddenly, and all at once, I was aware of a presence. A warm, throbbing, almost painful sensation came over me, almost like an external source of nerve stimuli, boldly yet calmingly letting me know that I wasn't alone. It was a kind of inherent awareness that one would experience in a dream. Only this wasn't a dream. My instincts directed my attention toward my bedroom window, to which, almost in a trance, I then walked and peered out of. What I saw was the vestige of an owl sitting on a tree branch. Not a screech owl or a spotted owl, but more of a barn owl, if I had to guess. It was very large and almost immaculately white. For the longest time, I was paralyzed, staring into its crimson, saucer-like eyes. I didn't know if I was frightened or intrigued, because this animal wasn't just staring at me, it seemed to be staring relentlessly into me. After at least four or five minutes of this, the owl then, with the air of utter calm, smiled at me. Looking into its eyes, I felt strangely comforted. The very moment I broke its gaze, however, everything changed. My tongue began throbbing with writhing pain that I can't even describe, almost like every individual muscle inside of it was tearing itself apart. I ran into the kitchen and put water on it, but it dried up like acid as soon as it touched. Panicking now, I put everything I could think of on my tongue to help evail the pain. Nothing seemed to be helping, but I was determined not to give up until the pain abated. It was ten minutes later when the swelling began. In addition to the writhing pain that had not let up one iota, my tongue now felt like it was being inflated with air from the inside. 
barely able to close my mouth, I ran past the window again towards my bedside. The owl was still there, with a smile as big as ever. Reaching for a bottle of ibuprofen, I tried to down a handful all at once, hoping that it would stop the swelling. I was unable to swallow, though, and the pills fell abruptly out of my mouth. Nothing seemed to be helping, and in a complete act of desperation, I ran back into the kitchen, past the smiling owl, into the silverware drawer. Opening it, I reluctantly pulled out my sharpest serrated steak knife. Holding my breath, I punctured my tongue with the knife, hoping that the wound would release some of the pressure. Instead, all of my muscles tightened around the knife hole, making my tongue's pain increase double-fold. Reduced to falling on the floor now, I did the only thing left any rational human being would do. I put the knife in my mouth and began sawing at my tongue. The pain of the blade was nothing compared to what I had been experiencing. Once my tongue was halfway severed, I paused for a second so as not to choke on my own blood, which was now pulling quite dramatically on the floor around me. Gagging on the knife blade, I finished the job, ripping the remaining tendrils in half as I yanked the wretched thing out. Showering the floor with blood, my severed tongue landed in front of me, squirming and flapping like a fish out of water. Disgusted and mortified, I kicked it across the floor into the bedroom and closed the kitchen door as to not see it, and even worse, not to hear it flapping around. Plugging my mouth with paper towels and trying desperately to maintain the bleeding, I sat crouched in a corner, suspended by shock and disbelief. As my heart rate finally slowed, I was frozen with fear. So many thoughts were rushing through my mind. They were all almost undecipherable. What had just happened? Is that a medical condition? Am I dreaming? What was with that owl? Was that an owl? Then, all too suddenly, the most horrifying revelation came over me, like a dark cloud. That owl had smiled at me through the window. It's anatomically impossible for an owl to smile. Overcome with a raw sense of primordial dread, I realized the truth. That was not an owl. There was no owl. That's not an owl, I screamed to myself. The glowering question now remained, if it wasn't an owl, what was it? I was beyond caring. I didn't want to know the truth. I didn't even want my tongue back. In that moment, all I wanted was to get away from the owl and back to placid safety. That's when a swooping noise broke my train of thought. Quickly, all fell silent, almost as if things were normal again. After waiting, I slowly opened the kitchen door to find that the severed tongue was gone. Approaching the bloody pool in the ground, I looked out the window once more, which was now strangely open. Staring back at me with crimson eyes, the owl was still perched on his branch. However, it was now poised to open its mouth. What happened next is beyond my realm of understanding. I knew it was impossible, yet it happened anyway. The owl opened its mouth and, with a brand new tongue, spoke to me with an unholy voice. I will survive, it said. Its smile then spread wider than it had before, revealing a pearly white set of teeth. It was at this point that I blacked out from fear. Once I awoke, the owl was nowhere to be found. The bleeding in my mouth had clotted, and I immediately got my things together and headed to the hospital. Once I was in the emergency room, having to communicate with pad and pencil, I informed the chief surgeon from where I came. A look of general unease came over his face as he reluctantly told me that the previous tenant of my apartment came in exactly one month prior, mysteriously missing all of her teeth. The End of The Smiling Owl My thanks to Creepypasta for posting that one, and to Justin Suttles for recommending it. But there is another podcast. Only five more to go until our 400th episode. This time, I want to thank Shirley Saldana, Nia Mayer, and Jason Dowd for coming aboard. 
Sometimes the wrong train takes you to the right station. To follow the podcast or the blog, just head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you'll find all the links you'll need. Do you want to help the show? The best thing that you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. This really does help us to grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. Thank you.